Hello, good afternoon, everybody. So I will continue today on the lecture about uh, age and sex structure on the chapter. But I just wanted to emphasize some points here because I received emails from students that got infected by COVID and had also some other health issues. And I sent it to you an email with like some links that you should proceed if you ever get tested positive for COVID. And um, in those links, I also added into the syllabus to make it really clear and also added as an announcement in Canvas. So here my website, our course website was teaching demography and population society fall 2021. In the syllabus on, um, on page 10, I added these two links here from the university that you should uh, uh, take a look if you get tested positive for COVID. So there's a page about uh, the positive test protocol and also the form that you should complete in case you get tested positive. And in this form here, if you, uh, in the previous 48 hours before you got tested positive, you came to this class, you should inform that in this question, what in-person classes or events did you attend in person starting from 48 hours before symptoms started? And this is the information from the class, right? So the same thing as here, Population Society, Course Sochi 312, Section 500, and my name is Ernesto Moral. This page here has a lot of information, has a flow chart that you can take a look. And the specific form, if you just go to that link, uh, stairs. Are these stairs? <laughs> Sometimes this is hard to see. <laughs> Begin the survey. That question is going to be more towards the end. Um, what in-person classes or events did you attend in person starting the 48 hours? And that information, you also have to add the date, but that information that I provide in the syllabus is exactly this one here that you need to put in this field. On For people who miss classes for any health reasons not necessarily related to COVID-19, you can request me to reopen any quizzes or exams that you missed. So I will reopen it for you in Canvas. You're gonna have the same amount of time after you started. And, um, but I just, we, you just have to send me the email with the documentation explaining the situation. And then we set up a time for you to take the quiz. You, and this information is so available on page eight, as I mentioned, the email, the makeup work policy but also on the page 10 of the syllabus, I have here some extracts from the student rule seven, which are mentioned here in the makeup work policy. So you can uh, better understand what are considered excuse absences and everything. The, in, and the other, some people have to quarantine if they get infected by COVID, so they will have to miss classes. So these classes, as you know, I have been recording them and I post them on YouTube. This year or this semester, the university is not doing that hybrid style of classes. So I, students are not supposed to join the class online while I'm teaching, but I can record the lectures and make them available to students afterwards. And that's what I do in the YouTube channel that I have seen before. I usually upload the lecture, I try to upload it in the same day uh, by the end of the evening. And I have been doing that for the last four lectures that we have in the two for uh, last weeks. Um, in Canvas, the thing that you already know. So in Canvas, the email, all emails that I sent you, I will just save them here in announcements. The page that you see is going to be similar to this one here. So in the main page at the bottom, I put the information about this COVID-19 statement. And here on announcements, I will always save the emails that I sent you guys, because if you miss the email, it's gonna be here, okay? 
So that's uh, the information that I added to the syllabus and by email and put it on Canvas as well. And people missing classes, they can download the slides in the course website. Here you can download all the lecture slides in PDF format. You can watch the lectures afterwards and you can take the quizzes at home starting at 2 p.m. of the assigned day for the quiz until 8 p.m. in the following day. But if you are sick, I can reopen that quiz or exempt you. Okay, any questions? Okay. I will continue then on the chapter about age and sex structure. And we were, we discussed about the changes in age structure in the world and what we expected for the next decades and centuries. And here is uh, uh, age sex structure for, for France from 2006. And in this case here, different from these previous ones that I showed, in these previous ones, the age and sex structure or the pyramid, the population pyramid is shown for every five year age group. In this case here, since for this data from France, the quality is good, they did this pyramid for every uh, single age. So that's why you see this variation here much more. They also have the information about age of individuals in the vertical axis and population in thousands. In this example here, it's not in percentage, but in thousands. And another thing that they did, in addition to what we saw before, they added the year of birth of these specific groups. And by doing that, we can see specific changes in the size of specific age groups through time link to historical events that are pointed there in the legend. So number one here, this is the birth deficit due to World War I, depleted cohorts. So people born around 1915 and 1920, a lot of them died during World War II. So because of that, the amount of people that reached older ages up to age 90 in this example here, it was smaller than what you saw even in previous cohorts here, okay? And much smaller than the, the common cohorts, people that were born afterwards. On two, this one here, we also see a dent on the pyramid. These are depleted cohorts, uh, when they reach reproductive ages. So these people here, back, so a lot of them died during, during World War II. So not as many of them went into the following age groups. In 2006, they were around 85, 90 years old. But when they were in reproductive ages, around their 20s, 30s, 40s, they were smaller in size, then they produce less children in total in thousands compared to other generations. So these people here are the children of these people here. So that's why you see this dent in this graph as well. Well, number three, there's the birth deficit due to World War II. Oh, sorry. Number one, I mentioned World War II. Number one is World War I. Sorry about that. Here's World War I, two are the children of these guys, and three is World War II, okay? And after the end of World War II, we see uh, economic development in several countries and people being more optimistic about lives, and then fertility increases. And that process that fertility increased a lot right after World War II is known as the baby boom, okay? And the baby boom uh, kind of lasted from right after World War II, 1945, until the mid 70s, okay? And then after that, we start to, and these guys here, it's not in the diagram, in the legend here, but these guys here are the children of these people here that some, a lot of them died during World War II, and then they have fewer children in total. 
This is just one example uh, for you to see how one simple graph that shows the age sex structure for population for one single year can tell us the story about the size of the population and link it to historical events, right? So that's just to, I mean, we, it's really easy for us to get uh, population pyramids for several countries for several years, even projections. I showed you in the last class that this website, populationpyramid.net, you can get similar uh, age sex structures for all countries in the world and for all different years. And here I just showed to you in these previous examples for the world. And you can do that for several countries and you can understand how population changes over time in terms of size due to historical uh, changes. And also we can compare countries between each other, not just one country over time, okay? This is just to show the, the population, the age sex structure of India in 2010 and how we expect the age sex structure of uh, India to be by 2050. And all these graphs here, I'm showing the source in the bottom. And, uh, and what we see is that today, I mean, we are already in 2021, but in this more recent years, still you have uh, high fertility in, China, in, in India uh, compared to other countries. And because of that, you still have high number of children under the age of 15. So these three first horizontal bars here, you see still a lot of boys and girls being born. But we expect for these next years, for these next decades, for fertility to decline in India, it has been declining not as fast as other countries. And by declining it, these people here, when they get older, they will not have as many children. So the number of children uh, will be even smaller than the previous generations, right? So because people start to have two, or like some people will have more than two children, but a lot of people will have around two children or less than that. So this is an example of to show a specific country how it has really high fertility and is gonna start changing the shape from a pyramid into a more rectangle shape of the population by age and sex. In China, you also see a decline in fertility and the decline in fertility can be seen even with the graph from 2010, much smaller cohort here between zero and nine years of age and these two first bars compared to previous ones, exactly because of not only the one child policy in China, but also because of economic development, there are different studies showing the influence of both. And even during the one child policy, as we're gonna see throughout the semester, on average, women still had around two children in China, and um, even with the one child policy, but two children on average per woman in China was much smaller than in previous generations. And that decline again, due to the policy, but also to economic development, and that made it decline. And it, we, this uh, reduction in fertility is not expected to increase, so as this, smaller uh, cohorts get older, you're gonna start to see still these people here were born in a period that fertility was really high. You're still gonna have this gap there. But as people get older and start to die, you also tend to have a more rectangular shape on the age sex structure of China. The European Union experienced fertility decline before than China and of course, then what India is starting to experience now. But, and then you see a huge drop in the overall number of people, again, measured in millions compared to previous generations. And in Europe, there are several studies trying to understand these really, really low levels of fertility. So 
the idea is that we want to provide to women and to families the possibility of them to have family planning, right? To plan when they want to have the child, if it's after they get a college degree, if it's after they get a job, if, if it's after they actually formally form our family. And um, by giving these chances to them, they will tend to postpone fertility, that, that discussion that I made in the last class about the tempo and the period. They can postpone it. And of course, whenever they want to have children, they should be allowed to have children. And, but usually in our current societies, what we see is that overall, on average, women are starting to go to have, on average, two children. We debate a lot about these oscillations in fertility. One of those videos that is in the, the course website by Hans Rosling, public, he was a public health researcher. He shows, I mean, we debate a lot about fluctuations in fertility, but overall, women get around two children, on average, of course. But in Europe, if you look at specific countries, Specific countries have really, really low levels of fertility, below two, even around 1.3 children per woman, 1.5, 1.7. Countries like Italy, Spain, and a lot of countries in, uh, in, the, in East Europe, they have been experiencing a lot of decline in fertility. Related to issues of economy, people having not really pros good prospects about their jobs, and also not support from the government in terms of childcare that make people have less children. And that happened really abrupt in Europe. So already in 2010, you see much smaller uh, cohort size for younger people. And overall, these people here will tend to have similar fertility, like around two or even less, than their parents. And this curve, we will also tend to be more rectangular in the, in the future, but we will also experience depopulation. If previous generations had much higher fertility and now they start to have less, fewer children, and these children also keep the same small fertility level, the overall size of the population, and here we are talking in millions for each one of these horizontal bars, it's going to decline over time. So depopulation is a reality for some countries. The issue is when you still have these high cohorts here getting older, and when they reach older ages, they need, and we will get out of the labor force and base all their income from retirement, then we are start to see some pressure, some demographic pressure in the society, because then we have these older cohorts that are bigger in size, getting older, and you have smaller cohorts that will move up here in labor ages. So you have fewer people in labor ages providing for uh, more people in retirement ages. Simple graphs, a simple age and structure age and sex structure of the population, you can understand a lot of what happened in the past. In that case of the uh, pyramid for France, we kind of base on the past. But in this one, here we can also start to think what's going to happen in the European Union by 2050. OK? For the United States, we also uh, see a decline in fertility overall, but in the US, the fertility did not decline as much as in the European Union. And also the US receives a lot, receive a lot of immigrants. And usually immigrants have higher fertility. And also the US born population has an overall fertility higher than European countries, right? So that's how the society is culturally and also the influence of immigrants. Of course, the number of children is declining over time for, per woman, 
but it doesn't decline as clearly as we saw in the graphs for the European Union and for China. And overall, we also expect people to live longer. As people live longer, more people in labor ages will survive to older ages. And we also expect this population to, this population structure to become more rectangular. But in this case here, there is not really an issue of depopulation. If we think that depopulation is an issue because you'd have more retired people depending on labor age uh, residents. And we are not we are not really seeing for this next decade, next decades in the US a depopulation exactly because fertility overall is still higher than what we see in the European Union and because of the influence of immigrants, okay? And we can break even more and you can go to specific websites. This, uh, this data here was collected by Dode Polston, the, the author of the textbook for this course. And he got data from the US Census Bureau. And the website in the US Census Bureau, and I have I provided a series, a series of different links within our course website that you can access really easy data. You can just collect the data in a table format and create your own pyramid and then be done for specific counties in the US in specific years. And broken down by five year age group in the vertical axis. And in this case here by percent of the population in the horizontal axis. It's data.census.gov. Since the Census Bureau lately, they have been trying to, they have so many different platforms with data and they just try to organize everything in one single website. You can just access by going data.census.gov. And, um, and it pretty much works as a Google search. You just say like table of Brazos County, population by age and sex. And then it's gonna show you a series of tables that you can download in Excel, and then you can work with the data. In these examples here, he's showing a county that has an older population. So proportionally, a lot of people between 55 and 74 years of age compared to younger, to to the younger bars, to the younger people. And when you look at the Brazos County, you see the opposite because of the size of Texas A&M. And we also have uh, Bling College here. And the overall county, the proportion of people between 20 and 24 are much, much bigger than other age groups. So you can analyze this information just by collecting this data, for example, from the Census Bureau. And this is data from 2013. So just to show you here in the course website, under, yeah, so this, this video is here by Hans Rosling, I really like them. He really explains all this uh, population changes over time in a really straightforward way, showing some nice interactive, interactive graphs using some blocks of representing people. It's, it's really good, it's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I also have here another video related to population age structure. And in this, this lecture that I'm showing is this link here on the top. And uh, this file here, examples of age structure and other indicators, if you download it, is a compressed zipped file. And it's gonna have a series of examples there of graphs. Under this bar chart, I have here age sex structure in Brazil. If you just go there, what I did to generate some of this age sex structure in Brazil, I just collected information in Brazil for specific years, by sex, male, female, and by age. Right, so by the same five year age groups until 80 plus. And this is the total of people. And I just entered this 
population here for this specific years. And I just created in a way that then I estimate the, the percentage of women in that specific age group in that specific year using information from the cells, from that cell of women between zero to four divided by the total population in Brazil in that year. And the way that you do this in Excel is pretty much a bar graph, bar graph like horizontal, in which one side it's negative and the other is positive. Usually the convention is to put male to the left and female to the right, of course, you can do whatever you want, but usually people do like this. Also the colors, you can do whatever you want. But the way that it, it worked here for me to have that order was with female as negative, male as positive, and afterwards as uh, Excel to invert it. But if you simply, for example, add information of population in Brazos County for a specific year, for men by age group, for women by age group, it's gonna generate this, this graph here for you automatically. This calculation here is already being done automatically in the, in the spreadsheet. And in this example, I did for 1980, 1991, and 2000. The website that I mentioned to you guys, I think I, uh, yeah, here in the bottom of the, our course website, I have like several links from the Census Bureau and this link here, data.census.gov that I just mentioned, you can pretty much just do as a Google search and then it's gonna show a list of tables related to your search and you can download the data, right? So that's the, the Census Bureau has been doing a great job on putting, being able to access from this same, this single website, several of their different databases. Good, any questions? Um, the next topic in this chapter is about age dependency that I'm talking, have been talking already bef before, even in the previous chapter, and is that comparison of how big is the cohort of children, of how many children you have in comparison to working age people. How many older people do you have in a specific society in a specific year compared to working age people, right? And if you are trying to talk overall, what's the total dependency ratio in a specific country, it is the ratio of the dependent age population who are considered the dependents here, children, those between zero to 14 years of age, and the elderly population, those with at least 65 years of age. So I just go in the population, I count how many of those are children, zero to 14, and how many are older people, at least 65, and then put in the numerator, and I divide by the working age population, those between 15 and 64. And we usually multiply this ratio by 100. So we have the information in, in percentage terms. Why this is called a ratio and not a rate based on the first lecture that we discussed in this course? Is a ratio because we are comparing the size of two different groups of people. We have in one side in this example, children and older people, and in the other side, we have working age people, and then we divide one by the other. A rate is when I'm counted here in the denominator and I have the chance of experiencing the event in the numerator, not here. Oh, but these people will get older and then they will go to the numerator. Yes, in another year, in another survey, in another census, but at this specific time point, they are either in the numerator or denominator. An example of uh, a rate, what's the mortality rate for a specific country? We calculate, we put in the denominator, the population of people in the numerator, those who died in a specific year. So those people in the denominator 
have a chance of experiencing the event being measured in the numerator. That's a rate. Comparing two separated groups, ratio, okay? That's why this specific indicator is called total dependency ratio. The higher the ratio, the more people each worker has to support. So the higher the ratio means that I have more children, more older people proportionally compared to people in working ages. And lower the age, the, the ratio, the fewer the number of dependents, fewer the number of children and older people in comparison to people in labor ages, okay? We also, I think this um, is related to some discussion that we had at the beginning of this semester. Uh, I think it was when Ethan asked a question uh, some weeks, either last week or the previous one, about like what exactly, how do we better understand the trends of total dependency ratio in a specific country over time? You can break it by the youth dependency ratio and the old age dependency ratio. And the old age dependency ratio can also be called age dependency ratio. And what's the difference between these two here to the previous one? The previous one, the total, the numerator is both children and older people. And this one's the numerator for the youth dependency ratio, it's only children divided by the same population between 15 and 64. And the old age dependency ratio, uh, the numerator are people with at least 65 years of age in the denominator working age population. And when you add one to the other, you get the same total dependency ratio, okay? And this is just an example of um, overall youth dependency ratio, old age dependency ratio, and total dependency ratio for selected countries in 2014. And you see that uh, in Macau, for example, you have really low uh, youth dependency ratio, old age dependency ratio, and like means low uh, fertility, and it's still not as many people in older ages. In 2014, South Korea, 21.6% of children for every 100 people in working ages, 13.5 uh, older people for every 100 people in working ages, and this one added to this one, we have the total dependency ratio. And then you see countries that in, in Africa, for example, that still have really high fertility, Nigeria, Gambia, Uganda, Chad, Niger, they have a lot of children compared to uh, the working age population. So in Nigeria, 83 children for every 100 people in working ages, uh, in, in working ages, okay? And in those countries, you still have a lot of people, a really high fertility, so really elevated youth dependency ratio, and not as many people still reached older ages. So the old age dependency ratio really is small, right? 5.7 people in Nigeria in older ages for every 100 people in labor ages in 2014, okay? This is an overview for one single year for several countries showing how these um, ratios, they vary over, they, they vary across countries. And we see, we better understand what's going on by breaking them down by the youth and the old age dependency ratios, not just looking at a total dependency ratio. If we just look at this one here, we don't know exactly what's driving this. Are they young? or the older. If we have these lower ones here, which one is really low? The youth dependency ratio or the old dependency ratio? By having both, it complements our knowledge about dependency ratio in those countries. This is data uh, for China in the US from 1950 until projections in 2050 and showing 
how uh, the youth dependency ratio declined in the US after the 60s and then kind of became stable and some little oscillations up and down. But in China, after the implementation of the one child policy in 1979, you see this really rapid decline in the uh, youth dependency ratio, right? So here we are focusing on the youth dependency ratio. The one child policy, there is less flexibility on the number of children that women have. But again, a lot of demographers doing research about uh, fertility in China emphasize that it's not just the effect of the one child policy, but also the influence of economic development. What do you mean about economic development? People start to move to urban areas, it's more expensive to provide uh, resources to children in terms of housing, in terms of food, even education being um, public, free. And also in China, we see a lot of migration, internal migration from rural to urban areas. And people in China are not free to move from rural to urban areas whenever they want. They need to get a permission from the government. And they, after they, only if they get the permission from the government, they, think they can take their whole family, move to the urban areas, and their whole family will have access to education and to the health public systems. If they move to urban areas without this permission, they, they don't have access to that. So what happens in China a lot is uh, men in labor ages moving from rural to urban areas, even without the permission from the government, leaving their family behind because they don't want their children to lose access to health and education systems, right? But all that economic development is more expensive to have children, to provide resources, one child policy made the youth dependency ratio decline a lot, which is linked to the decline in fertility in China. And we expect that now we are like around here, we expect it to be more stable over time. And now the one child policy finished around like 2013. And uh, the projections show that that youth dependence ratio might not oscillate too much because fertility might not oscillate so much in the next decades. And then when you look at the age dependency ratio for the same period for China and the US, what do you see here? The old age dependency ratio is more influenced by the declines in mortality. When you have decline in mortality, more people reach at least 65 years of age, then they enter in the numerator of the old age dependency ratio, and you start to see this increase over time. And really high in China, expected to be even higher than in the US proportionally. Ethan? What's the reason that the US uh, does not continue to go up in its age dependency ratio? Uh, in this case, because there is a limit on how much people can live, people will die, right? And also, so people will die, so we will not continue to go up there compared to the size of the working age population. And the fertility in the US has also been kind of like stable. So the generation of children being born will not be so different than the generation of people in working ages, but the people here in older ages will die. And then this, this number will kind of become stable over time. So you see improvements in uh, mortality. Improvements in mortality means that we have lower mortality, more people reach 65 years of age. We see that, but there is a limit until when we can live, right? But one thing that demographers have been talking about now in these last two years is that the pandemic has been so has been killing so many people. In the case of the US, it's really clear that that might affect the proportion of people in older ages. And that might affect one of the most important indicators of mortality, the life expectancy at birth. 
the pandemic. The pandemic might have effects on the life expectancy at birth, in the sense that the, the average number of years that we should expect to live in our society is going to decline in these next years because of this high level of mortality that we have been experienced since last year. Okay. And that might affect this in the future as well. The, the question will be if these projections here will not uh, actually be seen in the future because we might experience actually maybe a decline here in this next decade. And that's something to see based on how big the, the number of deaths will be in relation to people in labor ages. But the mortality is now increasing, not only mortality we have been seeing not only among older people, but also people in labor ages and, and also in case of children. So the actually effect of the pandemic on the total dependency ratio, youth dependency ratio, and old age dependency ratio is still to be seen. But in the life expectancy at birth, we will decline because of the pandemic. Some estimates already show that. And this is one example that I did for Brazil, just to talk about one concept that's important among demographers. Here, I'm showing only Brazil, data from 1950 to the projections by 2050. And this is data from the United Nations. And we see the black curve is the total dependency ratio. So numerator, children and other people, denominator, labor, uh, people in labor ages. So it increased until the 70s, and then it declined from the 70s until the 2000s, exactly because of people uh, having fewer children. And now it's stable around the years that we are right now and expected to increase in this next decade. How do we exactly understand the black curve? If we divide the black curve into the child dependency ratio and the old age dependency ratio. So we see the child dependency ratio, children divided by labor age people, decline overall is expected to keep going down because fertility keeps reducing in Brazil. And the old age dependency ratio, we expect it to increase, but in the previous decades it did increase, but not as much. But now, that we have more people having access to better health uh, services and better nutrition, they live longer and we expect a higher percent of people in older ages in the next decades in Brazil. I mentioned to you guys that Southeast Asian countries, they experience a lot of great economic boom in the 90s. And a lot of demographers uh, say that one of the factors that it contributed to economic development, for example, in Singapore, Taiwan, and so on, is the fact that they had, for a specific amount of time, lower percentage of dependents in the country compared to labor age people. You had lower percentage of children and older people in comparison to uh, people in labor ages. And those people in labor ages, in those specific countries, they receive good training, good education. So when they enter the labor market, also the economy was providing good jobs for them. So that provided an overall economic development, economic growth in those countries. That specific moment in which those countries experienced that it's not going to last forever. And that's really clear for the example of Brazil and some other Latin American countries as well. So Brazil is going to experience still low levels of dependency ratio up to expected around 2030. But then after that, because mortality is declining, more people will survive to older ages. The overall, the total dependency ratio, we expect it to increase. So this specific period here of time in which we can take advantage of the age structure of the country in order to put these people to work 
they are more in proportion related, related to children and older people, it's a window of opportunity for these countries. And is usually called by demographers as the demographic dividend. This window of opportunity is not going to last forever, right? Usually the term, if you Google the term demographic dividend, you're going to see a lot of publications. If you see, if you Google Southeast Asian countries, demographic dividend, a lot of studies being done with them. And some demographers also use the term demographic bonus. So that's this window of opportunity in which these countries we experience the lowest levels of the total dependency ratio, the black curve in this graph, that if those people in labor ages, they have good training, good education and job opportunities for them, that will provide economic growth and economic development as a whole to those countries. If they, these countries don't provide economic growth, economic development and jobs for people, we are not gonna experience that advantage of having fewer children and older people in our society. So what's gonna happen is that in the future here, these people, if they did not have enough savings, like really savings account for their retirement, and if they didn't have good education, good training when they were in labor ages, that will affect their future in terms of having earnings, in terms of having good health and so on. And that if we don't take advantage of this window of opportunity, we might have what not many demographers, but some demographers call it a demographic onus, right? These two terms on the top, they are not really popular, but the demographic dividend is popular. And it's a way to mention that we have this window of opportunity. We have to take advantage of it. Increase female labor force participation, increase education, overall job training to people, provide good education to children as well, and uh, provide to these people in labor ages the opportunity for them to get good jobs so they can save to the future. And if they had good jobs now, they also invest in their health. So all these different policies have to be in place. And Brazil, what we have been experiencing right now since the previous uh, presidential election in 2018 is exactly the opposite. Economic growth has been going down. The policies that we would need to improve uh, health and education of children and participation of, female, of women in the labor market are not being implemented. So the prospect to Brazil is gonna be really, it's really bad, right? In nine, Years from now, based on these estimations here, we're going to start to see the total dependency ratio increasing in the country. And the situation in Brazil has been like that like since 2016, 2018, really bad economic growth. Yep. Um, what is the range of like a healthy total dependency ratio? A healthy total dependency ratio. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I can give you a number like that. What's your name? Jose? Wow, that's, that's difficult. I mean, let's just look at this. Yeah, I mean, if you think about Japan that has experienced really low, have like fertility decline a lot, and is the country with the highest level of life expectancy in the world. People live longer in Japan than anywhere else. Their total dependence ratio based on this older data is around 64%. So I would, I would guess around that 60%. Around 60% if you have the older population who are there old now, they had the opportunity to have good jobs before, I would say that 60% is okay, but here, we are expecting Brazil to grant around 60%. But when these older people were in labor ages, they did not have experience, uh, possibility to have good jobs and to save. I mean, that's what the data, what, that's what the reality is showing us right now. But I would say that around 60%, let's see the US and 
Uh, we don't have the total, but the US, so here 30, yeah, 62 for the US, I'm just adding up here. And for China, so 28, 28, 37, yeah, so I would say like 60, 65 is okay, all right? And with this, this, with this idea that this is not automatic, you have to have other kind of policies, education, jobs, health, everything to take advantage of demography. If you don't link all these together, you're not going to take advantage. Cool. Great question, difficult to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so in that same graph and the same file, Excel file that I showed you the age sex structure for, the, for Brazil in this first tab here, there is also the dependency ratio. I pretty much just got information from this same four years. We have it broken down by, by age groups. And then I just added people who are children and people who are older and then the people in labor ages in these three groups here, zero to 14, 65 to over, and then the, um, the total of these two, and I create the dependency ratio graph. This, this is another way to do the dependency ratio graph, like the one here in this slide, I'm showing the curve separated, right? because I was just trying to show the really clear that child dependency ratio is declining and old age dependency ratio is increasing. And this other example from the same country, the lower, the light blue is the child dependency ratio has been declining over time. So of this graph here, of this part of the graph has been uh, an error. And the old age dependence ratio, the dark blue, has been increasing. The width of this area here is becoming wider. One plus the other is the total dependence ratio. This one here is the child dependence ratio. This one is the old age dependence ratio. In this graph, it's a little hard to know exactly how much is the old dependence ratio because I have to get this number here and subtract by this number here. So it depends on what I want to show. I show the graph in different ways, okay? So that's in that same compressed file that I showed to you guys. I think that this is just population in the US. Uh, yeah, we can, this one is kind of like an age structure for the population as a whole not by sex, or not, sorry, is the age structure of the whole population in the US, not by sex. And instead of having the horizontal bars, we have columns, right? That's a simple way to show it. And these other ones, now I will show this later on when we talk about source, sources of data. Yeah, I mean, some of those here, for example, the crude birth rate USA, I think I use this, figure in one of these slides in the previous class, right? So this one here in the previous two weeks. So a lot of like these examples are things that I, I calculated here by myself and the age specific fertility rate, something else that I wish uh, talk more. Oh yeah, this one here already showed it to you in the previous lecture. So a lot of these graphs that I show in a PowerPoint, you can also look at them in Excel. If you change the numbers here for your specific population and year, you're gonna have different curves. Cool? Questions? Uh, Age heaping. I mentioned to you at the beginning of this lecture that one of the things that we're going to talk about here is issues with data. In this case, it's pretty much issues with the age variable that we collected from people. When we have a survey, a census, we ask people their ages, 
usually we ask their completed age and also their date of birth to see if both are similar and make some corrections. But in some countries, what we see is that when people report their ages, they usually round it up or down. If someone is 27 years old, the person might report 25. If someone is 38, that person might report 40 and so on. So age heaping is not when we have problems with the age data collected in our surveys or census. So demographers use data from single age to determine whether the irregularities or inconsistencies in the data. So in order for us to know if the age variable is good in good quality in a specific database, can implement these methodological procedures that are discussed in the course textbook, and I'm going to explain here in this uh, in these slides. Age heaping happens if population for certain ages, for example, rounded it down or up to zero or five at the expense of other ages. Age heaping tends to be more pronounced among populations or population subgroups with low levels of education. People with lower levels of education tend to report, tend to misreport in higher degrees their exact ages, okay? Any examples of age heaping that could be related to cultural reasons as well. For example, 13 is frequently avoided in the US because it is considered unlucky. Hotels in the US and some Western countries sometimes have don't have the floor designated 13. That I didn't know actually. I think I saw here in the US for the first time when I mentioned the elevator. I think it was in New York and they had the floor 12, 12A, and 14. And that's related exactly to, to, to culture, right? The number of four is avoided in Korea and China since it has the same sound as the word character for death. So people who self-report as being 13 years old in the US and four years old in Korea and China might be lower than we would expect comparing to children, in this case, between three and five, and in this case, compared to children between 12 and 14, of ages 12 and 14. Maybe it was in China, South Korea, and some other uh, Asian countries also don't have the floors number four. This is the formula. I do not expect you to uh, memorize this formula or to calculate this formula. I just want you to interpret the formula right, which is the bottom here of this slide. But in order to understand the formula, I will explain it, how it's estimated. So this Whipple's method tries to see if people reporting specific ages is higher than other ages around them. And it pretty much measures the preference for the terminal digits zero and five, because usually, like I mentioned at the beginning, some people round it down or up to uh, ages ending zero or five. And his method usually concentrates on the analysis of ages between 20, 23 and 62. So it goes to 23 and 62. So this P23 is calculating how many people there is how many people there are in that specific country in that specific year with the age of 23, with the age of 24, 25, all single ages until 62. And then we just add them all here in the denominator. In the numerator, since the goal here is to measure whether people prefer Dig, uh, numbers finishing with 5 and 30, we just put 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, until 55, 60, right? So in this case here, we have pretty much 
one fifth of the population, or yeah, one of the population in the, the uh, numerator compared to the denominator, because we have we are excluding from here people with 23, 24, 26, 27, and so on. And the convention here, he multiplies it by five and multiplies it by 100 as well at the end. Technically, let's say, let's say that nobody in that population that I interviewed reporting having the age that ended with five or zero, 25, 30, 40, 45, 55, 60, nobody reported those ages. If nobody reported those ages, I will have here zero divided by whatever population I calculate here, zero multiplied by five and by 100, zero. That's when the digits zero and five are not reported. Let's say that I encounter similar people in all ages, similar no, if I, let's say that I counted here, exactly the same people with 23 years of age, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, and so on. So here, I have all people, the same number of people in each one of these single ages, and the same thing in the numerator. As I mentioned, the numerator is one, is one fifth of the denominator in terms of terms, because here we just have fives and thirties, or uh, numbers finishing with fives and zeros, sorry. If the, we have exactly the same number of people here, 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 in all these terms, when we add all these guys and divide by the sum of all these ones here, we're gonna have how much? One fifth multiplied by five, one. One fifth multiplied by five, one. Multiplied by 100, 100. Cool? Let's say another theoretical or hypothetical example. Nobody reports being 23, 24, 26, 27. Everybody reports their ages finishing with a five or zero. Everybody reports being either 25, 30, 35, 40, until 55, 60. So we have everybody in that population being counted as here. This number here, if I add everybody, it's gonna be exactly the same number as here, right? Nobody reported 23, zero. Nobody reported 24, zero. Nobody reported 26, 27, zero. So all these other numbers are zero. Only the ones finished with the five or zero digits have population. So the number in the numerator equals the number in the denominator. The number in the numerator equals the number in the denominator. You get, you divide one by the other, one. Multiply by five, multiply by 100, you get 500. So technically, this index could vary from zero to 500 yeah, because of how it's constructed. In reality, this is how we um, estimate whether the data is good in terms of reported age or not doesn't go so low as zero, and it doesn't go so high as 500. Actually, if we calculate this, um, this formula here for a specific country and get a result with at least 175, that's already really bad. It's not close to 500, but 175 is already bad. And any number below 105 is already really good.
right? So 105 is above this, but we already say that that data is of good quality. This number here, 175, bad data in terms of uh, preference for terminal digits of age. This is an example for Korea. Korea, and here's the, pretty much the age structure of Korea for women, right? So it's that same graph that I just showed to you in Excel for the US that I showed for the whole population. This one for Korea, 95, only women. And the difference here is that each column, every single age. So people with zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Female population. And what you see, you see some fluctuations from one age to the other, but that's okay because there are changes in fertility over time, as we saw in that clear example of the France age sex structure, the French uh, age sex structure. There is some variation over time in terms of fertility, mortality, but overall you have kind of like a smooth variation. And the Whipple method here gives us a result of 100.1, which is highly accurate, okay? For the male population in Pakistan, the same information for 91, sorry, for 1981, male population in Pakistan, and showing here single ages. Then we see all these jumps, right? We see here really high for 30, really high for 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70. Really clear preferences for digits. When we implement the Whipple's method that says oh, 175 is already really bad, this data here from Pakistan, male population 1981, 330.8. So, what is this telling us, if I want to do an analysis of the age structure of this population using this data here, I should be careful. And I should do not this analysis for single ages. The first thing that I should do is to group these ages in at least five year age groups. Even when I group them by five year age groups, I can still see all this oscillation I should group them more, 10 year age groups. I lose a lot of uh, specificity, uh, too much specificity of that data, but that's because of being of really low quality, okay? So this is just to show that if I have data, that the way that was collected was not really accurate, and I do this analysis for single ages, not doing any kind of uh, correction or even grouping specific ages, I could come up with wrong conclusions to my analysis, okay? The next topic, we already talked a little bit. Remember that graph that I showed before about the sex ratio over time for more developed countries, less developed countries, US and China. So the way that that graph was calculated was we calculated that ratio to show in, in that graph format is the sex ratio over time for specific groups of countries or countries. So the sex ratio is the most popular index of sex composition in demographic analysis. It's pretty much defined as the number of males per females. So it's pretty much, you get the number of uh, men in a specific population in a specific year, divided by the number of women, and multiplied by 100. If you have 105, it means that for every 105 men, you have 100 women. If you get the result of 93, for every 93 men, you have 100 women, right? And you can do this analysis for countries, for states, for counties, for cities. 
to just understand the sex structure of that specific population. When we have more men than women, these numbers will be above one, multiply by 100, we have a sex ratio above 100. When we have more women than men, this division is gonna be below one, multiply by 100, we're gonna have a sex ratio below 100, okay? We, in this case, we have more women than men. If we have 98 men for every 100 women, 98 divided by 100, point 98, multiplied by 198%, okay? That's really simple. And as I showed in the first lecture, really, really simple indicator, but really informative. We can understand a lot of things when we were discussing the examples of less developed countries, more developed countries, China and US. In general, national sex ratios tend to fall in the range from about 95 to 102. National sex ratios outside this range of 90 to 105 should be viewed as extreme. Maybe there is preference in boys than daughters. Maybe mortality is affecting more women than men because women don't have access to, to the health system or to a good overall life experience in terms of education, jobs, and that will affect their health in the future. This indicator can give us an overall idea of how the country is in terms of opportunities for men and women. And also in terms of deliberative uh, preferences for having boys instead of uh, girls. This is the graph that I put in the first, um, the first lecture. We see that more developed regions in green have a sex ratio below 100. Overall, more um, women than men, right? So, we have sex ratio below 100%. Less developed regions, overall more men than women. And it's pretty related really to that. A lot of these less developed countries, they have preference for boys when women are pregnant with girls. There is a lot of like a, a occurrence of uh, abortion after the ultrasound. And that has been the case in China, in India and so on. And in less, more developed countries, that's not the case. Any more developed countries, women have closer opportunities to men to good jobs, good education, and that will make them live longer. And living longer, overall, they will be bigger in size in that population. And in less developed countries, women have worse uh, opportunities in the society, they will tend to live, live less and you have more men. And here we get the case of the US in blue that falls in between these two groups and the case of China that has even higher sex ratios for this period between 1950 and 2015. And here I make it really clear what's the reference of being 100 to see which situations we get farther away from the equality in the number of men and women. Sex ratios by age group in, in, in Korea, 95. Here we break it by age group. We have more boys being born than girls above 100. But as women live longer, more men die faster than women in terms of age the sex ratio drops below 100 by the mid 50s. And then we start to have more women than men in older ages, okay? I will keep talking about this, it's 2 p.m. now. And I see you guys on Thursday. Thank you very much. <laughs>